Welcome to Inside Cornell, a series of policy discussions by Cornell scholars in Washington, D.C. Today the discussion is war powers and the balance between the executive and legislative branches. We have with us today Cornell law professor Jens Alin. He has written extensively on war powers and is a leading scholar on national security issues. He will be followed by Congressman Chris Gibson, who introduced legislation to reform war powers. Congressman Gibson is also a graduate of Cornell. He has an MA, an MPA, and a PhD from Cornell University. So um, we'll start with Jens. After um, both of the gentlemen are done speaking, um, we'll open the floor to questions. Thank you. Great, thanks Kathleen. Um, I thought what I'd do is <clears throat> speak for about 10 or 15 minutes um, about the legislative role in war making. I wanna start with a very uh, general discussion that might be a little bit abstract, but then I wanna apply some more abstract principles to specific examples uh, and then uh, hear from Professor, uh, not Professor, sorry, uh, Dr. Gibson on uh, uh, his proposal for uh, reforming the uh, War Powers Resolution. So um, as everyone knows, the <clears throat> framers in their wisdom divided the war making uh, authority between the two branches of government, between uh, Article I and Article II in the Constitution. Uh, the President is the Commander in Chief of the Armed Forces. <clears throat> On the other hand, Congress um, has the power to declare war, they have the power to define and punish offenses against the law of nations, and they have the all-important power of the purse. Uh, the question though becomes how you uh, allocate and balance the powers between the two branches, and it's not necessarily clear from reading the bare text of the Constitution what the appropriate balance between the two branches should be. Um, and what we see over the last few years, really um, over the last 25 years, ever since Vietnam, is an ongoing discussion between advocates of stronger executive power and advocates of stronger legislative power. What I want to do now is speak a little bit about the most familiar arguments that we hear about um, primacy for executive authority in war making. Uh, I want to canvas some of those frequently heard arguments that the president should have more uh, authority or more power or should exercise unilateral power in war making and I want to debunk some of these common uh, arguments. The first argument is that the executive branch is unitary while the legislative branch is divided and chaotic. The second argument is that the executive branch focuses its deliberations in secret which is its virtue because the uh, advisors in the executive branch are able to give their advice to the president in the kind of cloak of confidentiality and they are free to give uncomfortable and difficult opinions to their advisor where as in Congress the kind of uh, sunshine of transparency uh, leads to um, uh, opinions which are formed for the general public and not necessarily based on uh, their wisdom. The third argument that we hear often is that the executive branch is nimble and quick and capable of responding to a difficult security threat, whereas the legislature takes too long to act based on the deliberation that must necessarily precede any decision. Uh, this has become especially important in a world with unpredictable and difficult threats uh, in the war on terror. So I want to take all three of these arguments and try and debunk them. as efficiently as I can, uh, or at least provide the other side to the story. So uh, first, on the unitary nature of the executive and the divided nature of Congress. It seems to me that this is an argument which is a substantial exaggeration. Why is it an exaggeration? Well, first of all, <clears throat> the view of the executive branch and the White House as being a unitary branch of government is certainly outmoded and outdated. Over the last 25 years, the executive branch has grown in size such that the number of personnel working for the executive branch is now massive. Um, and so to sort of talk of the executive branch as being this kind of quaint, small branch of government, I think is just hopelessly outmoded. Um, but there's a kind of deeper conceptual point here which I wanna press with you. Um, the comeback to what I've said before is that the executive branch is unitary because the ultimate power and authority is vested in one individual, the President of the United States, whereas in Congress, the power is vested in a corporate body, right? A Congress which is divided between all the representatives and the senators. And that's what makes the President uh, and the executive branch a uh, unitary branch. Um, I think this is an exaggeration because it ignores uh, 
the fact that a collective group of individuals can be rational in their outcomes, uh, and I refer to this in my own scholarship as a form of collective rational, ra rationality. What I mean by that is that <clears throat> what makes a uh, group of individuals rational is whether or not they have a particular decision procedure to uh, resolve any disputes between them. And in the executive branch, you have a particular decision procedure, which is that the president decides uh, how to resolve disputes between his advisors, but Congress has its own decision procedure, and they have a majority voting rule. And that by itself can produce rational outcomes in the legislative branch. There's also one thing I'd like to add here, which is that people falsely assume that because the executive authority is vested in a single individual, the President of the United States, that means that the single individual will always act in a rational way. And I think that's wrong because it assumes that one individual will always, right, in their own mind, be clear and consistent in their views and never conflicted. But that, I think, is based on an outmoded view of psychology. We know that single individuals, just like corporate bodies, uh, can be conflicted, they can pull in multiple directions, they can act inconsistently, and that shows that uh, even the executive branch with the president at the helm can fall victim to irrationality. So all of this is just to say that we often exaggerate the kind of coherence that you find in an executive branch led by one individual, and we also exaggerate the kind of chaotic and disunity in the legislative branch. Right? The president can act in irrational ways, and by analogy, a corporate body like Congress can act in very rational ways as they seek to pursue uh, their objectives and their desiderata. Okay. The second point. The uh, executive deliberations will be performed in secret, and therefore, they're the ones that are getting the uh, most honest advice. I think that there's a kind of uh, fetish for security in the executive branch. Uh, there's a fetish for security. There's a, a fetish for secrecy. There's uh, a kind of obsession with pursuing debates and uh, receiving advice in private because there's a kind of sentiment that uh, when you receive advice in private, you'll be getting the most accurate information. But I think, in reality, the opposite might be true. The open deliberations of the legislative branch allow special interests to be kept in check, right? When you're in the executive branch, special interests have the opportunity to give their advice to the most important politician in the land, and without the kind of transparency, transparency and deliberative process of the uh, legislative branch, um, there's no check on special interests providing kind of covert <coughs> advice to um, public officials. So it's in Congress where you'll get the advice giving process in its purest form because transparency will ensure that the special interests give uh, honest advice that the people will find palatable. The other point I should make here is that <coughs> there's an assumption that the executive branch has a monopoly on security expertise. Right? You see this a lot in Supreme Court decisions coming down from the judiciary when you read uh, the um, uh, four most uh, conservative justices um, who <coughs> would support executive authority in, in war-making powers. And they sort of set up a dynamic where they suggest that the um, president and the executive branch has a monopoly on security expertise, right? He's got all of the information from the CIA, from the NSA, from DOD. He's got the experts who understand cyber warfare, who understand drones, who understand the emerging threats that the CIA analysts are giving him, and that somehow the legislative branch of government doesn't have access to the important information. And I think that kind of seriously overestimates the value of expertise in the executive branch, and I also think it substantially undervalues the level of expertise that can be found in Congress. Um, I'm not simply referring to the expertise of people like uh, Representative Gibson, who have expertise, but I just mean at the level of the staff, as well as the informa information collecting mechanism that Congress has for distilling and circulating information that might be uh, collected by other uh, agencies within the federal government. The last point has to do with nimbleness and the quickness with which the executive branch can um, respond to an emerging crisis. This I also think is a kind of, uh, there's an obsession in um, 
today's discussion about executive authority with the modern administrative state. The idea is that we live in an increasingly complex world um, and the nature of today's problems is such that only the executive branch can act quickly enough to solve the problem and that if we insist on leaving Congress to solve every single problem, uh, they'll craft a solution at which point it is passed into law and the solution is obsolete because the problem on the ground has moved into its next phase. Um, while in some circumstances it might be true that Congress acts in a sort of slower and more deliberative process, the important thing is that you need to balance nimbleness and speed with being responsive to the constituency. And I think that that's where you see an appropriate balance here. Whatever Congress might lose in terms of its nimbleness, it gains in being responsive to constituents. And that's increasingly important in the um, arena of war making authority, right? If there's one area in our democracy where we want to ensure that the decisions by the federal government um, take into account the will of the constituents, it's uh, a decision to go to war or to use military force. And so what Congress <coughs> might lose with a little bit of quickness or nimbleness, it gains in its uh, level of deliberation and responsiveness uh, to its constituents. Okay, so I now want to apply briefly these principles that I've described to some current examples and um, talk a little bit about why I think there should be an increased uh, role for legislative power in um, the war making process. So <clears throat> the first is the recent discussions of the AUMF. Um, after the 9-11 attacks, Congress passed the authorization for the use of military force, um, essentially giving the president authority to pursue and to use any available force to stop the individuals and organizations responsible for the 9-11 attacks. More than a decade later, we are still using the original AUMF framework uh, to authorize the military force that's being used against Al-Qaeda and um, other organizations. That framework is now hopelessly outdated. Um, we have a situation where the original core individuals who were responsible for the 9-11 attack have almost, with just very few exceptions, have all been either detained or killed, um, but yet the AUMF is still on the books. It's, I think, a, a framework that's desperately in need of either amendment or it needs to be replaced by a new AUMF. Now, why is it essential for Congress to be at the center of that discussion and create a new AUMF, which uh, will give new guidance for the president's prosecution of the war on terror? I think it's essential because a new AUMF would specifically list, or should specifically list, the organizations that the United States is currently engaged in an armed conflict with. Right? As you know, Al-Qaeda has now splintered off, and we have Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, we have AQIM, we've got Al-Shabaab, all of these very splinter groups. And the United States should make clear, and I think it's the legislative branch that needs to be at the forefront here, the United States needs to make absolutely clear which groups we are engaged in an armed conflict with. Uh, and a new AUMF uh, would certainly accomplish that task. I think this is important for both internal and external reasons. It's important uh, in the internal realm because if we had an AUMF which specifically listed the organizations that we're engaged in an armed conflict with, it would provide the information to our own constituents or to our own constitu uh, you know, to the public at large, to the people, which organizations the federal government is using force on their behalf. That's the crucial point here. When the president is using military force, he's using it on behalf of the people. And the people, I think, have the right to know which organization's force is being used against on their behalf, um, especially when that force includes something uh, like a targeted killing uh, with a drone strike. It's also incredibly important in terms of the external audience. If we had a new AUMF that specifically listed the organizations that we're at war with, right, we would be able to speak to the world community and explain precisely the organizations that we're at war with, and we would then be able to take the necessary second step, which is to articulate a clear legal justification for why we're engaged in an armed conflict with each and every one of those specific organizations. To date, because we don't have an AUMF framework, we don't specifically list 
to the entire world, the organizations that we're engaged in an armed conflict with, we're not able to effectively to effectively communicate the legal rationale for our use of force against those organizations. And the result is, in the sort of four corners of the globe, we have foreign populations who are very angry at the United States because they think we're violating international law. I happen to think that there are strong reasons, right, um, clear reasons why we're, we are allowed to exercise military force against these organizations under international law, but there's been a failure to communicate those legal arguments to the rest of the world. And I think an AUMF spearheaded by Congress that specifically listed the organizations that were engaged in an armed conflict would be the first step to solving this failure to communicate to the world the legal architecture for our uh, armed conflict. One last point that I want to make briefly uh, that sort of bring things down to a concrete level. The dispute over the allocation of war making authority between the uh, Article 1 and Article 2 of the Constitution is not a Democrat versus Republican issue. I think that's pretty clear. Uh, it's an Article 1, Article 2 issue and on both sides of the aisle there are politicians who are in favor of stronger executive authority or stronger legislative authority. Um, before Obama became president, I think most people sort of assumed that he would be in favor of greater legislative um, uh, power in this realm as in others, but since he's become president, it's been clear that he's an advocate for strong uh, executive uh, authority. That much has been clear even this week with the controversy over the uh, transfer of the detainees and the prisoner swap with the Taliban. Right? Obama ignored the statutory 30-day notice period to Congress, which was required before the transfer of any detainees. And uh, he argued that this was a situation where the restriction was inapplicable because it was inefficacious, right? He needed the flexibility to move, in qui uh, move quickly and transfer the detainees as part of a very fast-moving situation on the ground, and this was the only way of uh, securing the release of an American service member. Uh, I think this shows that <clears throat> uh, Obama is a president who is um, concerned with either stabilizing or perhaps increasing uh, the level of authority for the executive branch and is willing to go um, as far as ignoring a statutory requirement um, regarding the treatment of uh, detainees at Guantanamo. Now, I should say, I think a lot of the restrictions that Congress has placed on Obama are very unfortunate restrictions, um, especially with regard to the closing of Guantanamo. I had wished that Obama had closed it a long time ago, but it was clear that Congress placed a lot of restrictions on him, and so it proved too difficult. But that's not so much the issue uh, in terms of whether or not these restrictions are smart policy or poor policy. The issue is whether or not <clears throat> there's a rule for the executive branch or for the legislative branch. And I think it's clear that Obama, even though he's a Democrat, is uh, an advocate for the strongest possible executive authority in war making. And <clears throat> what we need is a Congress that will stand up and will reassert its uh, important and constitutional and historic role in the war making process. Thank you. Thank you, Jens, and uh, I'm in general agreement with uh, uh, what our professor just laid out here. What I think uh, what might be helpful before we get into a, a broader Q&A is to sketch out a little bit of uh, why I think this is a very important issue and then what I'm doing about it in the United States Congress. Uh, the first thing is I want to thank Cornell for the opportunity. Uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to work with uh, Cornell University, a proud alum uh, myself. And you know this this issue is uh, is very important, near and dear to my heart. Uh, first and foremost, I spent 29 years in uniform, starting out as an enlisted man, private in the infantry in the New York Army National Guard. For five years, I was in the National Guard, and then I spent 24 years in the regular army. I had four combat tours to Iraq. I also served in Kosovo, and I served in Haiti. So you know, I have uh, led our troops uh, in battle. Uh, I have had, uh, I've had uh, troops killed under my command. Uh, I think of them every day. Uh, I think of their families. Uh, you know, I, I have had troops wounded, grievously wounded, and I've had others who have wounds you don't see, uh, emotional wounds that they carry with them to this day. And I think that the decision on the use of force is among the most solemn that any nation can make, particularly one that's a representative democracy. 
And so, uh, you know, for me, that's the first thing, is, uh, is somebody who has seen this firsthand, has, uh, has been involved in, in armed conflict and battle. Uh, the second is uh, from my scholarly work. Uh, three of the years I served in the United States Army, I taught at the United, St United States Military Academy at West Point, and this was a subject area where the cadets, we had them read extensively and debate, and to talk about this area uh, because they were going to be raising their right hand to uh, support and defend the Constitution. It was important that they understood what exactly uh, that meant in terms of uh, how a republic goes to war. Uh, and then third, obviously, it now as a legislator, putting this uh, together, uh, and, and I, I should say that as part of uh, preparation to teach at West Point, uh, I earned a PhD, as was mentioned, at Cornell, and my research was in U.S. decision-making, national security decision-making, and it was at the nexus, it was civil-military relations, and so decisions on the use of force was central to that research. Uh, suffice it to say that our founders struggled with this issue. They struggled mightily, actually. Their first inclination was to severely restrain the executive, because they had seen King George go through this, uh, visited upon them. Uh, not only had he trampled on uh, our civil liberties, uh, but it was perceived that he would use fiat and send his armies anywhere to do anything. And uh, our founders were, yes, they were uh, well-read, uh, and they were, uh, I would argue, uh, incredible philosophers. But what they wrote was real. I mean, it was based on experiences that happened to us. And so you see this in the notes on the Constitution. You see them, you know, and then they pause and they think better of it. They realize that, well, we can't completely restrain the executive because, as Jens mentioned, we have to defend ourselves too. So ultimately, they come up with uh, a system of countervailing forces. You know, Ted Lowy said, we made a government with no one in charge and we like it that way. That's one way to look at it. And uh, Richard Neustadt, from Harvard said, uh, we set up a system with separate institutions sharing power. Uh, and this was from a, a close read of history that any time you allow for power to be accumulated, it will be abused. And so our founders then set up uh, checks and balances and then auxiliary checks. Uh, and, and this is really at the center of decisions on the use of force. You see this in, in the Federalist Papers. You see this in 69. And this is Alexander. Alexander Hamilton writing in 69, which I think is significant since he was the one who was the biggest proponent for the executive power, but he's really uh, calming his countrymen by saying, look, what we're talking about here is the commander in chief under this design would be the first general or first admiral. This president would not have the power to declare war, nor would this president have the ability to even raise and regulate forces. That would be those both reside in the legislative branch. And with that as uh, seminal, uh, you know, we move forward. And um, you, know, you look at the, how the first generation lived the document. I think that's instructive because uh, you see domestic politics come into play. Um, John Adams is president in 1798, and he starts taking a lot of criticism because our sailors are being impressed. They're out on the seas. They're being taken, and Congress is shin kicking the president. We haven't seen that before, have we? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, they're saying, Why are you not doing anything? And Adam says, I have taken some action. But if you want me to do more, you're going to have to declare war. This is interesting because the president's using the founding documents to say, I'm working within the limit of the law here. If you want me to be more aggressive, you're going to have to give me a declaration of war. Well, Congress passed legislation to instructed Adams to act as if a state of war existed. I think that's important. That's the language they used. And then in 1802, and why this is important is now you have a completely different administration from a different political party, and it's Jefferson. President Jefferson is dealing with the pirates, uh, and now we're talking Libya or the Barbary Coast. And once again, Congress is critical. Come on, Jefferson, how come you're not doing more to protect uh, American uh, service members and, and to protect our interests. And once again, Jefferson sounds similar to Adams. He says, look, I've taken some action here in defense, but if you want me to take more action, you're going to have to give me a declaration of war. Congress authorizes the use of force. This is important because occasionally in this conversation, it starts to go down this rabbit hole that you have to declare war. That's, I don't think, what the founders intended. What they said is any time that you use military force, there has to be the people's representatives giving authorization 
in the first instance. Th there are a couple other circumstances I think you could argue from original intent that also give the president powers. And so the first one is authorization from the people's representatives, either a declaration of war or an authorization. The second is an attack on the United States. And you see this in the notes on the Constitution. Um, it's clear that you know, if we're attacked, the president, as our commander in chief, can respond. And he, can, uh, he or she can, can deploy our forces into combat or to imminent threat of combat. The third, I actually uh, argue from looking closely at the Constitution in another section that talks about state power. You know, it basically, there's a section in the Constitution that, that prohibits the states from entering into combat or uh, into, uh, into war unless they're attacked or imminent threat of attack. That's a direct quote from the Constitution, or imminent threat of attack. So certainly if the founders intended for the states to be able to have power under imminent threat, then you could argue that the president has that power of imminent threat. So with those three provisos, I think that is really what the intent uh, of, of what the founders had in mind for, for legislative or legal basis for the use of force. So what's happened over time? Well, we've declared war 11 times with five different conflicts. So World War I and World War II, there were multiple declarations of war uh, uh, for that, but, but five times in five different conflicts have we declared war. And then in others, uh, there have been uh, congressional authorization, but uh, particularly since the advent of the nuclear age, war powers have been consolidated into the executive branch and presidents from both political parties have taken us off to war without the consent of the governed. And uh, so this is really where I think uh, what Jens was talking about, this is where I'm trying to make a difference on this. I have a bill, um, H.R. 383, the War Powers Reform Act. And the reason why we're bringing it forward is uh, in 1973, in the aftermath of Vietnam, uh, Congress took action to try to reassert more congressional prerogative on the solemn decision on the use of force. And the issues with the War Powers Resolution, which was put into effect of law over the veto of President Nixon, uh, it's important to note that, that this law went into effect, no president of any party, of either party, has ever acknowledged the constitutionality of the War Powers Resolution. However, um, there's never been sort of this epiphanal moment when we've had uh, a Supreme Court judgment as to whether or not it's uh, constitutional or not. Now, so it's survived on the books and has been uh, part of the discussion from time to time since 1973 until Libya, until Libya of 2011. Here's the issue. My fellow colleagues, my colleagues believe that what this law does, the War Powers Resolution, is it essentially gives the president 60 days to take any kind of action, and beyond that, he needs an authorization. Now, I want you to understand, I don't, that's not my read of the War Powers Resolution. But why it's significant is that's what my colleagues believe it says. So, uh, now, Libya, any pretext, we went beyond the 60 and beyond the 90 days for Libya and yet there was no repercussion here. So I actually brought forward my bill before the Libyan situation, but I would argue now more than ever, we need a War Powers Reform Act because, because they went past the 60 and 90 day threshold, it's hard to even argue that, uh, that Congress has this legislative authority, has this legal authority because presidents of both parties have not acknowledged it, the Supreme Court has not spoken finally on it, and we went beyond what most members here think the legal authority is of the War Powers Reform Act. So what does my bill do then? The War Powers Reform Act essentially does two things. The first thing is, is bring more clarity to the situation, and that is to say that the president, he or she, may not introduce American service members into combat or imminent threat of combat unless those three circumstances uh, unless there's a threshold met, either, either an authorization of some kind from the people's representatives, an attack on the United States, or an imminent threat of attack. If one of those three circumstances are met, the president uh, has the, uh, the authority uh, to introduce our troops in, into combat or imminent threat of combat. In the absence of that, the president may not obligate or expend funds. That's the move here, is to the purse. So the president may not obligate or expend funds to put troops into uh, combat or imminent threat of combat unless the president has a legal authority to do it. 
Now, so just to put a finer point on that, uh, if the president wants to engage in coercive diplomacy, the president can make statements, international statements, can have uh, communique, can have, uh, uh, can work with uh, friends and allies, while the president is mobilizing troops here in the United States. See, the troop, the, the commander in chief can mobilize at Fort Bragg and other places to to show that we are beginning to take action to back up what it is the president thinks we need to do. But the president cannot move those troops in, into combat or imminent threat without the uh, authorization uh, from, from the people's representatives. That's the key thing, is the obligation and the use of, uh, of funds. The second thing that our bill does is it helps uh, eliminate the uh, confusion by taking away those 60, 90 day requirements. So in my bill, we actually eliminate that because that created more confusion than it did anything else. Uh, because, again, my colleagues seem to think that the president has some authority to just unilaterally put our troops into imminent threat or into combat for 60 days. So I don't think that that was ever the intent of the War Powers Reform Act. So, um, so the bill has uh, 44 co-sponsors. I'm the 40, uh, I would be, counting me, there's 45 members that were in both parties. This is another point that Jens made, uh, is that uh, I have 10 Democrats who have come along with me on this bill, including Adam Smith, who I regard as one of the leading defense intellectuals here. He's on this bill as well. So, you know, I, I just think this is a really important uh, uh, legislative uh, piece of legislation that needs to become law. And finally, let me just say this. I think this is going to have to be an issue for the presidential campaign of 2016. Why? Because uh, if we end up, let's just say for a moment, we pass this bill in the House and then the Senate passes it. If we end up with another situation where this goes over the veto of the president, we're not going to get to where we need to be. We need a president that will actually sign this. So why would a president then sign it if every single president has not acknowledged the constitutionality? See, I argue that a president would want to sign it. Because what are one of the issues that presidents deal with? They deal with the issue of legitimacy and whether or not their action, it's, this is a part of a political problem that presidents have. If they don't have the American people behind them, that puts them in a very isolated political situation, and if the, the military operation starts to head south, now they're very exposed. So I would think that if we word this in a way that we show consistency with the original intent of the founders, I believe that the right president will sign this, because it is important to our republic, because that's really the central issue. How does the republic defend itself? Thank you. Any questions? I'd like to uh, redirect you back to the authorization for, for the use of military force. It's been stretched pretty far beyond its original intent. Yeah. The original intent is to target those who claim 9 11. They're, they're, pushed, that they're dead or languishing in Guantanamo. Is, is it setting aside what's going to happen on the War Powers Act? Do you think C Congress, particularly the House, is prepared to rewrite the AUMF for this year? So uh, we had a, an amendment vote about 10 days ago. It was the Schiff Amendment. And the Schiff Amendment was part of the National Defense Policy Bill, and that would have uh, sunsetted the AUMF of 2001. I voted for that amendment. Uh, there were about 180, 183 or so that voted for that amendment, so we're still short of where we need to be to be able to uh, take the first step on this. Because assuming that you sunset the AUMF, that sets the conditions for the debate and the specificity for what would a rewrite would look like. So I, I am one of those who believes that uh, that 2001 initial authorization has uh, run its course and has done its job and it should sunset and we should bring forward new authorizing legislation. And it should, and the other piece of this is, as part of my research on all this, we have, we should get in the habit of using sunsets uh, for, and specificity in the authorization to use military force. Give you an example. In August of 1964, something happened in the Gulf of Tonk Tonkin. We're pretty sure something happened. We're not exactly sure what happened. It's disputed, even to this day. But Congress, um, in relatively obscure ways, or at least um, not highly publicized ways, had a vote here uh, in, in the halls. And I think with only one exception, uh, voted to authorize the President of the United States to use any means necessary to take action for whatever happened in the Gulf of Tonkin. 
That became the legal framework for putting 500,000 U.S. service members in uh, Vietnam. So I think we can learn from that. That, And then you even take a look at uh, the, the run-up to uh, the Iraq War. Uh, there was a vote that took place here in October of 2012, and there were some members who felt that when President Bush took action in March of, uh, of, of 2003, that it didn't comport with that initial vote. Now, you know, you could take a look and one can draw their own conclusions on that, but it does bring up this point, that when we write authorizations, they need to be specific to what it is the intent of Congress is, and there, I, I believe there ought to be a sunset in that. Keep in mind, a sunset doesn't mean that we're giving up our security. It just means that the people's representatives have to debate again and take another vote before we continue any uh, military action. So if you're uh, explaining to your Republican colleagues who, who led to the defeat of the sh of ship amendment, how do you make the case to them that this will not be used against them and as a, an example of being weak on terrorism? Well, I mean, uh, I guess I'm in a strong position having bled for this country uh, in, on the battlefield, but I, mean, I, I just tell them, I just bring sincerity and integrity to the job and say, look, the people are counting on us that we are going to question and that we are going to debate and that we will have a fine point on our authorization. And as I mentioned just moments ago, there's nothing about the sunset of the AMF of 2001 uh, that would mean that uh, we're going to be soft on Al-Qaeda. Uh, what it means is that we're going to have to have a debate as to how, what threat remains and what specific authorization needs to be brought forward and signed by the President that will help us address that threat. Because as uh, Jens mentioned, uh, we find ourselves from time to time in a tenuous situation in relation to legal authority for targeting. Uh, not to dominate, but just one other question. Yeah. Could you shed some light on what members of your caucus think about why they're not going to let the AMF sunset? What, what's the reasoning? Well, that's one you'd really want to um, do more research on and ask people explicitly. But uh, generally, one of the issues we have here in the Congress is folks really spread themselves very thin. Uh, they come from all walks of life. Uh, folks come from the business sector, uh, academia, they come from uh, state, uh, local government, and not everyone feels that they have the resident expertise uh, to study the issue in great depth, to, to really walk out on it and to take a strong position. So they tend to, to listen, and listening's a great thing, right? But it, but it also makes for a very cautious body when it comes to this issue. Uh, I've done my best to try to illuminate the subject. Uh, I've done that in one-on-one -on -one conversations, and we've had some success here. Uh, you know, I have brought along 44 colleagues with me on this bill, which is a rather bold bill. Uh, but then on other uh, legislative action, including amendments, I've helped uh, lobby or persuade, you might say, my colleagues. These votes are very interesting votes because they don't cut along party lines. How do they cut? Well, um, so uh, really it's just, it's a vote of conscience, I think. Uh, there's a, um, I think there's actually, if you want to try to describe, uh, and you do some with some peril, uh, you'll see some uh, common ground between liberal and libertarian in terms of belief in freedom and privacy and in being very circumspect about the use of force. Uh, I'm not a pacifist, uh, but I also believe we've used force too often. Uh, I, I want to see us lead with our strengths. I think our greatest strength is, uh, is our ideals, as instantiated in our founding documents. And on our best day, other countries want to be like us, mm -hmm. but because of the incredible freedom that comes with our uh, way of life. And you know, we, we diminish that to a degree when we're seen as taking fiat and playing fast and loose, even with some of our own uh, stipulations of law. So, uh, now look, uh, I, I think that by leading with our strength, that means uh, a State Department that is uh, advancing our ideals, it means trade policies that are helping our peoples and peoples around the world uplifting uh, through, uh, through trade. It also means our engagement from a diplomatic standpoint. There are things that we do, for example, one of my um, deployments was in Haiti. You know, what we did in the aftermath of that devastating earthquake was really significant in helping uh, our cause around the world because I led the ground forces there for the Army. And I can tell you, we worked with uh, militaries from all over the world, and they saw how hard we were working. Uh, 
for the Haitian people. And, uh, and they went back and told their governments and their people how sincere we were in trying to make a difference. The water projects we do, I mean, it's not widely known here. We tend to take it for granted in the land flowing with milk and honey, but you know, water is probably the biggest issue around the world, clean, access to clean water. And uh, you know, the water projects that we've done in, in parts of the world have done as much to uh, help us from a leverage standpoint, an influence standpoint, and even by second order effects security as some of these other operations that we've done. The, the work, some of the work we've done to help fight AIDS. But, and why? Because when we show an affinity, an empathy for the struggles that people are going through and a sincere effort to engage and help, that's, making, that's advancing the cause of mankind and it's making us all safer. Now, look, we still need the world's strongest military as a deterrent, as a deterrent. But if you, if you recur back to some of our earliest thinking on this topic, uh, you know, you know, in fact, we used to have a, uh, a flag that said, don't tread on me. What was implied is if you don't tread on us, we won't tread on you. And you know, can, you can remember one of the earliest arguments. Uh, after the passion that was the revolution, I say that with some, uh, I mean, generally a lot of historians think about a third of the folks were supporting the revolution, a third were kind of on the fence, and a third were opposed, but, but we were successful. Uh, and then in the immediate aftermath, there was a re rebellion in France. And there were those that wanted to get involved in France. And George Washington said, no, we're not going to do that. That's not what we do. We're a republic. We're going to stay out of that. And you know, that was certainly debated here. But that was really the kind of example that, that our founders, it was disputed to some degree. But at least George Washington and others thought we were better off being a peaceful republic and leading by example and trying to influence the world in that way. So I would tell you that may be the way that you see common ground here is uh, now that's there are some that believe in a school of thought uh, that started with it was a uh, I'm probably being too general here but it was called the democratic peace uh, theory and there was this belief that if we're you know if we're advancing democracy we're making the world safer here's the thing on that is that it's when you take that walk from using doing that by our ideals and influence to using military force to doing it that's a long walk, and there's a lot of unintended consequences that go along with it. Uh, Neoconservatism was one of the theories that uh, was advanced that argued that we need to be more engaged militarily. And I've been opposed to that. I'm in print on my book, uh, Securing the State. And in general, I, I just think that uh, that path going to, and keep in mind, uh, those that supported that thought came from both parties. They're primarily Republicans, but they came from both parties. And just real quickly, if I could, following up on this idea of the liberal libertarian convergence, do you think that that it's an analogous to what's at play with sentiments about um, NSA and government surveillance? That it is. It is. I, you know, in my remarks when I first was responding to your question, I talked about how at that intersection, you'll find strong support for the Bill of Rights and for peace, peace and freedom. And I think that you know, if you see the voting patterns. Uh, if you were, if one was to analyze, and graduate students may yet do it, um, take a look at the vote for uh, the, um, the reauthorization of the Patriot Act, uh, which I could not vote for. I voted no. And then if you look at, uh, if you look at the vote um, that was the Amash Amendment, that was to roll back Section 215 uh, of the Patriot Act, and if you take a look at the voting patterns there, you'll see similar vote patterns to the Schiff Amendment. I had a question. Oh, I'm sorry. You go ahead. Let me. I just wanted to briefly ask you um, uh, about one aspect of the War Powers uh, Reform yeah. Act you mentioned, because I actually wonder if maybe there's a, there's an area there where I might even go even further than you. Um, there was a, a point when you were describing the Reform Act where you described the kind of trigger as being. A uh, situation where the president places our troop, troops into harm's way, and um, I was wondering if maybe that uh, itself gives too much leeway to the president. Um, right? One of the arguments in uh, you know in Libya, of course, uh, was that the there was increased authority for the president to, to use mm -hmm. force precisely because our troops were not in in harm's way. Well, see, um, so here's how I respond to that. Uh, my view of my bill is that the president would absolutely require authorization uh, before conducting that operation in Libya. Uh, 
because when we engage with uh, armed aircraft and drop bombs, you're putting uh, those pilots in imminent threat because uh, there's uh, anti-aircraft uh, gunfire that did in fact come from the ground. So when our pilots get shot at, the president has put our troops into combat or e even as they approach the airspace, that's imminent threat right. of, of combat. You know, here's another thing too that we haven't yet talked about I think is really important. I mentioned earlier empathy and how important that is uh, to engagement and diplomacy. Uh, and to really be an effective. It, it's important here on the Hill, this listening, and I, I, back home I, I'm engaged in listening every day, and I think that's really important to good representation. I also think it's important to understanding what it means to use force. So for example, there's this moment last summer when, and, and you keep in mind that last summer is when it became highly topical, the issue over Syria. But, but you might be interested to know that I was gauged on that topic months before it was in the front page of the papers. Peter Welch and I, a Democrat from Vermont, good friend, uh, we were engaged on this subject dating back to April, May, because we saw this coming. We thought, you know, our, our and I'm going to get to the empathy point, the connection, is we argued that you can't arm those rebels unless you have an authorization from the people's representatives. And it was taken a step further by the administration who believed that when we dropped bombs, potentially, on Syria, that that wasn't an act of war. Because when I was arguing that if we're going to, you know, if this country is going to engage in, or if, if our country is going to arm rebels in Syria, there needs to be a debate and a vote here. And some pushed back and they said, no, 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 we have a long precedent. I said, well, think about it this way. I mentioned empathy. If another country gave aid to a rebel group for the express purpose of attacking our country, how would we view that? We would view that as an act of war. And similarly, you know, when we engaged, when my office was engaged, was, was in discussions with the administration, and they were assuring us, oh, we're not talking about going to war with Syria. And I said, excuse me, didn't, aren't you talking about dropping bombs on Syria? They said, yeah, but we're not going to go to war with them. I said, well, you know, if Syria dropped a bomb on us, we sure would think that they went to war with us. This is what I'm saying, that we don't see this blind spot. Somehow we think that we can have two standards here. And, and again, I'm not a pacifist. I'm not saying don't ever use force. I'm saying we've been too quick to use force, and when we can actually use other instruments of power to actually achieve what it is we've been intending to do, and it's in, I think that's in the best interest of humankind, if we can achieve our interests without having to use military force. So, and at the very least, there ought to at least be a debate and a vote. And look, I, I understand democracy. If I'm outvoted, I get that, you know? But there should at least be a debate, debate and a vote. Were, were you drawing a distinction between targeted drone strikes and bombing o over the issue of risk to pilots? So here's the key thing on this. From a legal standpoint, right now, the administration is using the AUMF of 2001. Uh, for the drone strikes. Now, there are, as Jens was uh, alluding to, there have been moments when it's legally contested whether or not it's covered under that. Uh, and that's really the point of why we should have a new authorization. So now from the administration standpoint, I want to be clear, they believe they're within the letter of the law because they're, they believe they're covered under the AOMF of 2001. Associated forces here is the key, the key term, because you know, 2001 AOMF says Al-Qaeda, Taliban, and associated forces. But does, does your legislation speak to that distinction? So the legislation explicitly talks to the authorization to use force, which is explicitly under Title 10. Now, the President has obliquely addressed the subject when he's talked about moving these drone strike legal authority from Title 50 to Title 10. So, but, but but specifically, my legislation deals with Title 10. Well, here, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a law school professor, so I like hypotheticals. So let's, yeah. let's offer a, uh, a hypothetical. Assume that a president, not this president, a president were to launch a Title 10 operation, meaning not a covert action, but a regular right. Title 10 operation, solely deploying remotely piloted vehicles. And let's throw in, to make it even more interesting, some cyber offensive weapons against a foreign country, right, where all of the personnel involved, whether DOD or other personnel, would be all stateside in country. Would that be covered by, would that trigger 
the restrictive machinery of the War Powers so Reform it's a Act great, or it's a not? Great question. I argue yes. Oh, you yeah. argue yes. Okay, I would excellent. argue yes. I, I would fantastic. argue yes because it's 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 combat. If you're, it's combat, if it's okay. combat. and again, it's it's Good. this point that I think um, I could make in court. You know, this idea that you know there is a standard. I mean, if you're dropping bombs on a country, you're killing people and breaking things. And I don't I feel pretty strongly I'd be able to back that up. So if you're using UAVs to drop bombs, I mean, you're uh, you're conducting an act of war. So, and again, there would have to be that authorization. Do I understand your? The argument on the War Powers Reform Act yeah. is that you address the constitutionality separation of powers issue by going after appropriations, which you uh, yes. denied we have authority over. Yes. But you're effectively doing the same thing. You're effectively checking the executive power. Absolutely. So why would the president have any reason to do anything but fight vigorously your, your bill? Well, two, two points. Uh, one is what presidents have seen in both parties is that even though they're very jealously guarding the executive prerogative, it comes at a cost because the issue of legitimacy is, is, is exposed. So a president finds uh, oneself, him, him or her, finds himself in a, uh, a more challenging situation if the military uh, ex expedition starts to head south. So if you get everybody involved in this, authorizing it, then at least everyone's in it together. That's what I'd argue. A president, plus we're just stronger as a country. When we all go together, if, if it's divided, we're, that's a real, and even Colin Powell would say this when he talked about uh, going back to the 80s, him and uh, Weinberg, when they talked, you know, the country should go united. The second thing is, is I really think that given all of these experiences that we've been through over the last over do dozen years, that I would think that in a presidential campaign, we should be able to attract the support of a candidate to take this cause on. Believe me, I'm going to be uh, vocal on this. Have any candidates expressed interest in, no. in taking it on? And here's why. And I will tell you this. I think somewhere along the lines there's some school for candidates. You, you read about it in the Times and other places. <laughs> you know, this person's now got advisors helping them get schooled up, getting ready. And somehow all these advisors tell them, Guard all those powers, you know? You know what, I want to see the candidate that actually says that we're gonna restore the balance back to our country. That's not weakness, that's strength. It's not just this issue, it's in many others. You know, the, the presidential candidate that actually comes forward, you know, you look at the accountability in other parts of the world. Take a look for a moment what happens uh, in the parliament in Great Britain. There's a moment when the executive, the prime minister, goes before the House of Commons and stands for questions. And, you know, our, we could use this in our country. I mean, not exactly that, uh, but I'm saying that having a president, instead of having it staged, we have this moment, happens once a year when the president comes down here and it's theater. You know, everybody comes in and then we announce the president and he comes in and the president gives a speech. I think what would be more effective and meaningful is if the executive actually stood before this body right here, along with the cabinet. And said, I'm here, make a brief statement, and then answer questions. I want to see the presidential candidate that does that. Our people are ready for this, and I don't care what party they're in, or independents. You have the whole C SPAN audience. Yeah. They, <laughs> well, I mean, I'll just tell you, I'm, I'm in all my village hamlets and towns. I have 165 towns, I have over 1,000 village hamlets and towns, and regardless of what party people are in, they, they want to see more accountability and transparency in their government. And this is one way to do it. And this is, this is a symptom. This, this war powers, it's, it's a very passionate one for me, given my background and experiences. But it's only symptomatic of a larger issue. In fact, Jens talked about the secrecy in the executive branch. It's not just in war powers. It's in so many other things. Uh, there's this, um, somehow, this belief that, uh, that if the executive branch is doing it, it's apolitical. For example, we went through this big contestation over earmarks uh, not long ago. And, but listen, I mean, we're kidding ourselves if you don't think the same process is going on in the basement of one of these executive branches. It's, there's just not as much transparency as to where the project is going. You know, before at least the executive branch here, there really needs to be, and I would tell you that, on that issue, there should still be more give and take. There really needs to be transparency, and our founders, I think, were right on this score, that they were, we were meant to sh have countervailing forces. As Ted Lowy said, you know, we made a government with no one in charge and we like it that way. They, this is this, 
this is the best hope that we have for mankind to prevent the accumulation of tyrannical power is by having checks and balances. Do you have, have you had any indication from the appropriate committees that there'll be more power hearings or AUMF hearings? So I did get a hearing on my bill. Okay. Uh, it's, it's been held. Well, but it was in 2011. <laughs> And it was pretty, it's on the internet. You can take a look at it. Um, Armed Services Committee? Uh, it's in the Foreign Affairs Committee, which is the Committee of Jurisdiction here. And it was immediately after uh, Libya. Now, one could, I think, describe that as a partisan hearing, right? Because Republicans were looking like they were trying to make hay over the exposed position the Obama administration was in. Um, I make great effort in my testimony to argue it's not partisan. There, this is this long tradition, there's long precedent that presidents from both parties have done this. And I have an interesting give and take with Mr. Berman, Howard Berman from, he was the ranking member at the time. So we have had one hearing, I've been trying to get another hearing. Uh, and then quite candidly, um, my own leadership opposes me on this. They oppose me. Wow. So, there are Republicans who believe in uh, big government power for the, uh, for the executive. Uh, this is, this, as Jens has accurately described, this is, interestingly enough, not a partisan issue. Th this is really one of how one approaches uh, the issue of uh, arraying power. I want to I wanna make sure I'm clear. I'm not yielding for one moment. People say, well, your views uh, make us uh, less safe and weaker. I wouldn't yield an inch on that. I don't agree at all. I don't think, I think we can be safer by staying truer to our ideals. Uh, and I think that makes us actually stronger in the world. When, because again, on our best day, you know, other countries want to be like us. And I think when we stay true to that, we are an example for the world. And think about this. As a younger country as we are, we have the longest standing stable constitution in the world right now. That's a fact ask something about the prisoner exchange from your perspective do you see this as a legal or a philosophical debate or both um, well I think it's both it's definitely a legal debate and I think it's one that's unresolved at this point it's uh, I think it's an issue that's got some serious traction and people are going to be discussing it for for days if not weeks and months uh, it's not one that's going to go before the judicial branch because uh, judicial branch has a political question doctrine and they have a uh, long-standing policy of not stepping in between disputes between the executive and, and, uh, and Congress. Um, so we're not going to see a resolution um, from the Supreme Court. So what we're going to have to see is a political dispute resolved by the people themselves, potentially in the next, in the next election. Um, it's clear to me that Obama violated the statute, um, which clearly called for 30-day notice, and he didn't, he didn't offer it. Um, that was a violation of the statute. Either at that point you have to say the statute is unconstitutional and therefore the president didn't have to follow the statute, or you have to interpret or reinterpret the statute in a way that makes it more flexible. So there's a 30-day notice requirement, but in the kind of unwritten margins of the statute, there are exceptions for situations of exigency that demand unilateral presidential action, which is what we happened, what happened in this case. I think that that's a little bit of a tough argument to make because there's no exceptions listed in the statute. It's pretty categorical. Um, but I think that's the kind of argument that the administration is testing out, right? Not that the statute is unconstitutional, but let's interpret the statute in a much more flexible way so as to make it constitutional. And I think that's what he's done here. But as we've seen, a lot of members of Congress are, are, are really chafing at that interpretation. So uh, that's exactly right. I mean, uh, the administration is arguing exigency uh, for the troopers' health, uh, and that's one that we're going to learn more about here in the coming days and, and weeks. Uh, we've heard uh, from members in both parties that have questioned that. Um, so there's more to learn on that score. Uh, so there is this legal point. And keep in mind, the president signed it. Uh, and as Jens mentioned, the frustration that I have is we haven't been able to get Supreme Court, res there have been eight times uh, since the uh, War Powers Resolution where the people's representatives have sued 
the President of the United States for noncompliance with the War Powers Resolution. There were six times when a, a Republican President was sued, and there was two times when a Democratic President was sued. And in all eight cases, not for the same reason, but generally for the reason that Jens mentioned, they have been dismissed. They have not been, the Supreme Court's sort of like, you know, these two 800 pound gorillas are coming, I'm not going to choose between you guys, are going to have to sort this out. So we actually had a moment this year where we had a chance to have some legislation that could have made an impact on this. This was Trey Gowdy's bill uh, that came up maybe two months ago uh, that was going to set up the process for how laws would be followed, and then if not, then there would have to be adjudication by the Supreme Court. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, so I thought that the legislation had promised, so I actually tried to get my amendment on there. <laughs> And my leadership sniffed it out soon enough. I said, if you're sincere, if you believe this, then you would want to have war powers in this. No, rule that order. Rule that order. So it was really more of a political effort than it was a, a sincere effort to try to make a difference, uh, unfortunately. So, um, you know, there is that. And then there is the philosophical one, too, right? Um, because, uh, and it is a complex issue, right? Because on the one hand, we don't want to leave anyone behind. We want to bring all American service members home. Uh, keep in mind, there are not just one way to do that. Uh, our military is trained to conduct a raid uh, to uh, recapture and to bring home uh, service members, and we've done that in the past. We've had uh, military operations that um, bring uh, POWs back. Uh, so there's, and then there's also negotiations. There is a long history of negotiations. There have been prison exchanges since the revolution uh, and, and forward. So there is that. It, for me, it just comes down to a matter of judgment. I just, if I, look, the president, President Obama is the commander in chief. It's his call to make. If it were my call to make, I wouldn't have approved that. I don't think that was a good choice. I'm talking about the judgment here. Uh, you know, there's the issue of the timing of this. Uh, I, I personally believe that we've uh, accomplished the task that we needed to accomplish in Afghanistan. Uh, we have, uh, you know, you take a look at Al-Qaeda, and uh, we decimated their leadership, as Jens mentioned. We prevented them from establishing a safe haven. Going forward, there is the enduring requirement to prevent that, but I believe we can do that from over the horizon, from naval platforms in the Arabian Sea and in uh, the Indian Ocean. So I don't think we should leave troops there for two more years. Uh, so I disagree. And if the President wants to continue to train, well, we can do that at Fort Benning, Georgia, the home of the infantry, and the Afghanistan should pay. The Af Afghanistan government should pay for it. They've found precious metals in that country. Now they're arguing it's going to take time uh, to, to extract those precious metals. Fine. We'll give them a note. And they can pay us back over time. We've been paying for too much of other people's security, and we've been, it's been a free rider problem. So I just don't think we need to keep American forces on the ground there for two more years. I disagree with the President on that. But that brings into question his judgment on this exchange, because you know these commanders, these battlefield commanders, these high-level battlefield commanders, they're going to be uh, kept in gutter for maybe up to 11 and a half more months, and they're going to be freed. And one of them's already said he's going to go out to back to the battlefield and try to kill American uh, soldiers. So I I just question the judgment in this particular case. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. I We've got to go. Thank you very much. Hey, thank you. This has been wonderful. I appreciate Cornell. Thank you, Jens. Thank, thank you, you Kathleen. Thank, thank you for you. doing this. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you.